It's, it's a system by which waste is converted into biogas and the digestate also is used for fertilizer, uh, thereby avoiding this huge problem that we have all over the country of garbage heaps. You know, you have landfills, but then you don't have landfills, you don't have land for landfills, and then you have uh, anybody traveling around Delhi in particular see these mountains of garbage piled up, unhealthy, unhygienic. Uh, so, there is this technique which has been developed, which has worked wonderfully well abroad, we have not brought it to our country. We have tried some pilot projects and it is now working in some very small community level uh, 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 units. But it needs to be, more research needs to be done in it. It has to be validated and certified for Indian uh, solid waste, which has a different composition, moisture content and other uh, features, which are different from those produced in the US and Europe. But it, it exists. There are uh, research uh, thesis on this. It is something that needs to be picked up by Indian scientists and developed and validated for Indian conditions. The second one, Israeli agricultural technologies is much better known uh, and much better used, you know, uh, vertical farming, soil solarization, drip irrigation, etc., etc. It's already being, and semi-arid, uh, agriculture in semi-arid zones is already being applied in a large number of areas. Uh, this is something I was discussing with a few people before uh, uh, during tea. You know, there is this is a, a technology developed in some Russian labs by which, uh, you know, it's a what I'll read this out a coal microwave pulse technology by which high energy pulse is applied to kill microorganisms. It's, since it's a pulse, the temperature does not go up, but at the same time, due to the high E field, the discharge is adequate to kill microorganisms. Now, if applied to milk, which we now pasteurize, it takes half the time and one-third the cost of pasteurization. Besides which, it is applicable across the board to all categories of liquids, all categories of solids. It's a, it's a great technology. It's been developed in a lab. There's a group of Indian scientists, by the way, sponsored by DST, a group of scientists that went to Russia, which looked at this technology and which felt that this has tremendous applications in India. Again, this is the kind of thing that scientists should be looking for. And then there is this last one, which, which I'll say, no, there are two more. But essentially, uh, baggage and cargo screening. Again, this is a technique of microwave radiation. It's got a two-plane scanning and measuring, two-plane scanning, and essentially it identifies material inside a container on the basis of atomic number and density. And it can actually, uh, uh, the, the radiation can penetrate containers, it can penetrate cars. Can you imagine from a, from a uh, national security perspective or from the perspective of, you know, these checkpoints across trade checkpoints, if, if this kind of a technology is available, how much it can speed up and make cheaper the uh, transaction costs of trade. It exists, it exists in laboratory form. And then, of course, there is a fog dispersal technology by ionization that, uh, again, was developed in, a, in uh, a lab in Russia, which, which has been studied. These have been studied by DST, but we have to take the next step. I'll come to the problems in the next step. Then you have a whole series of other technologies. These are developmental applications I talked about earlier. But there are other technologies that India has been trying to develop, which are available out there, but which, we, which require science diplomacy of a different kind in order to get supercomputing, you know, this uh, we have. There was an Indian delegation that came to uh, to Russia, and 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 discovered that there are certain technologies that they have developed for hot water cooling uh, of supercomputing units. And as many of you would know, the virtually the the cap to supercomputing capacity is the energy that you can uh, actually provide for it. So, if you reduce the um, energy intensity, you are able to increase supercomputing capacity. So, it's a great use. This is a technology that is available. India has these special steels, a variety of special steels, particularly CRGO steels. India has been trying to manufacture over many years now. We are basically a 100% importer of this product. Only three countries in the world that manufacture it, USA, Japan, Russia. And we have not yet got the technology. Similarly, aircraft manufacturing, particularly aircraft engine, uh, is something that we've been trying for many years. There's, it's not a shame because 
I mean, people say DRDO has been trying to de develop the Kaveri engine for many years. Actually, no country has developed an aircraft engine in 50, 60 years. It takes a very long time. But there are technologies available which we should try to get, and we have to find methodologies for getting them. Rare earths. Again, this is a major, major gap. And uh, incidentally, a lot of work has been done in NIAS about how India should move up the value chain in rare earths from, from the raw material uh, stage to a uh, finished product stage. We are dependent on rare earths, so tremendously dependent on rare earths. And if you start going in for wind power and for electric vehicles and so on, we'll be even more dependent on, uh, on rare earths. Uh, I think uh, you know, as scientists, you know, actually every... Uh, every cell phone that you have uses probably 16 of the 17 rare earths which are available. We need to be getting control of technologies. We need to be getting control over the use of rare earths. And science diplomacy has to achieve this for us. Information security is another very sensitive area, including cryptography. It's an area where we are not as strong as we should be. It, it's an area which has defense and national security uh, implications. And therefore, Trying to obtain technologies in these areas require a very special form of diplomacy. But all of these are technologies that we should get, and science diplomacy is the method in which we have to try to get these technologies. Two sets of uh, technologies which I mentioned now. One is this, those which have developmental applications, and the other which uh, have applications for our, which, which have growth, which are applications for our industrial growth, let's put it that way. What are the challenges? Of course, you can add many more challenges to the one that I'm mentioning here. But the challenges in the, in, under the heads of method and mindset. Backward linkage. Backward linkage is a major problem. You know, you have produced the technology. From there, to produce the uh, product, to go through the various stages for, to commercialize this and to make it available is a big challenge which we have not actually mastered. In, in some of the examples that I gave before, for example, microwave purification of solids and liquids, what needs to be done? You know, you need to, of course, firstly validate it for Indian conditions. But even more importantly, you have to go through a certification process. You know, you have our food safety uh, standards which have to be fulfilled. You've got to get WHO to, to certify it. Once you do all that, then I'm sure an entrepreneur will find it hugely profitable. But somehow we do not know how to bridge the gap and here is something that DST has not been able to do as well. Because we, when I was ambassador in Moscow, I was in regular touch with DST. Uh, and DST made various efforts to do this. But the point is from, from taking it from a technology in a lab through a validation, certification and production process, we do not have proper uh, methodologies to do this and we have to develop this. Second, sound technical input into government decision making. And that I think many of you as scientists would have been tearing your hair about some of the things that the government is doing which from a scientific perspective is stupid. And yet they uh, do it. You see, uh, we have to have a much better method of scientists and scientific uh, uh, theories disseminating into government's policy which have much wider implications. You take some very simple examples. You know, you have telecom equipment that we import. We import from a number of countries. We import a lot from China. And there is all this hysteria about, you know, embedded software and how it is uh, affecting your uh, national security and so on. You see, we need to be clear as to what is actually affecting national security and what actually helps your industrial growth. And this has to be an input into policy making so that your import policy does not spoil your foreign relations and yet protects your national interest. So this, this kind of technical input into uh, government decision making, which eventually has a foreign policy implication, is also what you might consider as science diplomacy. Mm. Recognize other strength and our weakness. I said this a little earlier, uh, actually. You see, there are things which we can pick up from various countries, even if they are small countries. Uh, Ireland is an example that comes to mind. When I, used to, when I was in Ireland, I used to write about various things that Ireland was doing. And I used to get a very dismissive response saying that, you know, we are a big country, we can do all these things. Actually, you can't. There are things that they have done very well, which we can learn and therefore speed up our own. Uh, for example, you know, this whole, by the way, this whole uh, call center business process outsourcing was a, was a methodology which was pioneered in Ireland before it came to India. We got it from Ireland. In terms of, in terms of uh, the research industry linkages, they've got some techniques which are wonderful which works beautifully well. 
I'm not talking about directed research alone. I'm talking about how research is being adapted to industrial requirements and therefore this commercialization of technologies is something that's been developed into, uh, uh, into a fine art, if I might say so. So these are things that we can learn. And, and finally, you know, if you have to actually get science diplomacy succeed, it has to have an all-of-government approach. I talked about these, these technologies like CRGO steel and aircraft, aircraft manufacturing and, and etc. Et See, these are technologies that are controlled by certain countries. How do you get them? Why, why should they give it to you and thereby undermine their own commercial uh, uh, competitiveness? It can be done only if you can do it through an all-of-government approach. You have relations with these countries, so you can give them something somewhere and then you take something somewhere. So you need to be able to do a give and take and that goes beyond, science is required but that goes beyond science and that's again another way in which scientists and uh, diplomats have to work together in order to uh, achieve a, a result. Now there are a few other areas which don't often get recognized when you say that uh, uh, science diplomacy, uh, that they are used in science diplomacy. The first one, project SNT uh, achievements for economic benefit. And this, I said earlier that, you know, our, uh, even our private sector companies have the stake in science diplomacy. See, you have a problem today in the image of our country abroad. Our country is often considered as a poor country. I mean, this is, this is a, an example which I gave, give repeatedly ad nauseum. You know, you, you have this whole concept of a, a, a picture of a bullock cart carrying some required materials into an atomic power plant uh, in India. Now, people's concept of India is that of the bullock cart and not that of the atomic energy plant. And we need to change that. We need to change this concept. We need to show our economic achievements. We need to show our technological achievements so that people abroad, markets abroad are open for us. You know, when I was in Russia, there were these companies who were coming to Russia saying, we, we are trying to sell CNC machines. And the invariable response was, you're coming from India, what do you know about CNC machines? Do you actually make CNC machines? You know, this is the kind of mindset that you need to correct. Again, part of science diplomacy, you need, and, and the more you can project your scientific achievements, the more you're able to sell your products abroad, the more you're able to attract investment into high-tech areas. Uh, you know, this, this, I, I had this, when we were, this whole debate about F-16 and uh, aircraft, which America is trying to make us buy. I, I had this uh, fellow from the F-16 factory in America saying that, you know, we have to first come here and teach you engineering skills. So we'll actually move our assembly line here. And when you learn the engineering skills, <coughs> eventually you'll, you'll manage to uh, uh, manufacture the aircraft. Now, many of these engineering skills exist here. You are actually manufacturing aircraft parts which are being supplied to Boeing. HAL does that as well. So, you know, you need to be able to project our achievements so that we are able to get better economic benefit in, in our uh, business. Then there is this, that, now we come to the soft power uh, part of it. Impart science and technology capacity to developing countries. You know, there are developing countries in Asia, in Africa, to which we can, can impart our developmental experience, things, how we have used science and technology for development, whether it is in space, whether it is in IT, whether it is in e-governance. Now, these are things that we can actually uh, give to other countries and thereby uh, win friends and influence people, if you like. And that's, that's actually the soft power aspect of uh, science and technology uh, 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 diplomacy. Then you have technology sharing and technology denial. Till recently, we were actually part of the, a, re a regime where technology was being denied to us. Gradually, export control regimes are being, are uh, opening up towards India. We're now members of the MTCR. We are now have technology. We are, now the shoe is on the other uh, foot. We are in a position where we can share technology or we can deny technology. And we use this for foreign policy purposes. You know, if you want to develop relations with a country, you are uh, sharing specific sensitive technologies with other countries you do not. Uh, in the BRICS context, you must have come across this about how uh, the difference in your dealing with Russia, difference in your dealing with China. But uh, anyway, we can expand on this later. And also, make in India. This is again one of my pet themes. You know, when you're, when you're in the defense area, when we are trying to expand Indian manufacture of defense products, 
We need to have a much better understanding of the technologies we want, the technologies we can develop, and the technologies that, uh, uh, for which we need to uh, attract uh, companies from abroad. Scientific input is very strongly required for that. So into a very brief uh, listing of all that I said so far, science diplomacy consists of facilitating international science and technology cooperation that we call diplomacy for science, providing scientific inputs into foreign policy making, we call it science and diplomacy, using science cooperation as a foreign policy instrument, which I just now talked about, the science for, dipl for diplomacy, and reconciling science and national interests in any diplom multilateral diplomacy. I mentioned this in so many different areas, whether it is climate change, whether it is uh, disarmament, whether it is in internet governance as well. Uh, we need to somehow integrate science and diplomacy to see that we can get the best for our country. Uh, I come back to this. This is what I call a technology success and a diplomacy failure. You know, we are, all these facts are known to you. One of only four countries to orbit Mars, of course, country, countries in inverted commas, because the fourth was the European State uh, Space Agency and not a country. The others, of course, are uh, Russia and uh, USSR and USA. Only country to consider at first attempt, minimal cost, one-tenth of NASA mission. But we were not able to project this as a technological achievement. We were not able to project this to, for, to be able to tell people the level of, yes, scientists and engineers abroad know it. But you want a much wider audience to know it so as to open up your markets for you. Uh, and this is the big scientific challenge now. You know, you need to generate $1 trillion of investment for new solar technologies. You need to create finance and business models. You need to build R&D technologies. And can India achieve 100 gigawatts by 2022? This is a major challenge. It's a major uh, challenge of diplomacy as well as science as well as that of science diplomacy. So, so essentially, in short, science needs more diplomacy. Diplomacy needs more science. And it is something that we need to put together. And now, when you talk about BRICS, uh, you will see actually an interplay of everything that I mentioned uh, in, in the past. You, are, you have opportunities to create linkages, and yet you see that there are some blocks. In some cases, there are bigger blocks. In some cases, there are smaller blocks. You need, in order to open doors, you need variety of government assistance, you need variety of uh, scientific inputs. So it's a, it's a difficult task to be able to maximize or to optimize your cooperation in the BRICS scientific forum, now in, in the BRICS science forum. Uh, I'll stop here because what I'd like to do really is to hear from you how, any of course, any comments or questions which you have about this, but also about how in the larger context of the BRICS uh, scientific forum, you can, uh, or, or you you can approach some of these issues. Thank you. And I think I'll take questions. Yeah, you can. Yeah, a little more comfortable. Yes. <clears throat> so take this. Friends, you had a very masterful summary of uh, science, diplomacy, challenges, opportunities, and how young scientists and BRICS can play a role. Forum is open for discussion now. Uh, 